All righty. Hello. So this is before you hit publish, make sure everyone's in the right spot. So SEO techniques for content optimization, because ultimately nobody wants to be this guy. <laughs> Why isn't it going? Dang it. All right, here we go. Um, so I'm Sarah Nicklin. I am the senior search strategist for Top Hat Rank. Um, Arson, who just spoke before me, is our CEO and founder. Um, and I'm a big fan of fantasy stuff and dragons, so you guys are just going to have to deal with that for this presentation. <laughs> Makes it more fun for me. So let's get started. As you've probably heard, content is king. Quality content. Search engines love good quality content. And so that's really what you should be focusing on when putting together the content on your website. In the past, you could do all sorts of shady, tricky things, such as content stuffing, over-optimizing, over content spinning. You can't do that stuff anymore. And that's all because of this guy, the panda, panda king. <laughs> So if you're not familiar, Panda is the portion of Google's algorithm that deals with content, and it will reward or not reward your website based on the quality of your content. Why they call it Panda, I don't know, but that's, that's what it is. So now the content on your website needs to add value and needs to be good, structured, quality content if you want to rank. So if content is king, then Yoast is queen. And if you're not familiar with Yoast SEO, it's the number one WordPress plugin out there. You should all be running it on your WordPress sites. It allows you to easily customize a lot of SEO um, fact factors without needing to know any code or do any development work. Um, this is a tutorial where you can learn more about the customization and settings. Just a quick overview of some of my recommended settings. You want to use excerpts to generate your meta descriptions. Um, in the new version of Yoast, you can just write in excerpt and it puts it in that little purple bubble. In the past, you had to use it, do it with the percent signs in there. So depending on the version of Yoast that you're running, you're going to do one or the other. In general, you also want to no index your author, date archives, and tag pages in your blog. The reason for this is that these are not your primary landing pages. You can have a lot of tags that are really useful for people to navigate through your site. However, this is not useful for search engines as far as landing pages or where people are going to come in. So these pages clog up Google's index. And when Google is crawling through your site, you want to allocate your crawl budget to the top level important money making pages rather than having the spiders go through the pages that don't really mean anything. So no indexing those gets them out of Google's index allows Google to focus on your important pages. I would say some, a caveat to this is if you have like a notable person that is an author that's writing for you, someone that has search volume for their name, you might want to leave the author pages indexed if someone's searching for them and they're coming to the website based on that searcher's name. I would also recommend disabling media attachments. Again, unnecessary pages clogs up the index. And you don't want people to be able to click on an image and see nothing but an image on your website with no content attached to it. It really doesn't add any value at all. You should also enable breadcrumbs. Regardless of the type of website that you have, breadcrumbs are fantastic and should be included. They're not only good for users to be able to know where you are on the website and to be able to quickly navigate back and forth between different types of categories, but for search engines, they also help create relationships between pages and help to structure your content. You want to remove the category prefix from all of your URLs, which is the option down at the bottom there in Yoast. Having category in your URL really doesn't help you at all. It's not descriptive. It doesn't add any information. So just get rid of it. It takes up extra space. You also want to fill in all of your social profile information in the Yoast settings. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And again, if you missed the link for the tutorial, there it is at the bottom. So we have our king and our queen. Here's the rest of our royal court. And so this is everything that we're going to be going over in this topic as far as content optimization. At the bottom, we have the extra little fun magical pieces, which is why I call them the royal wizards. So before we dive into this, why do you care about this stuff? Well, it works. So this is um, from one of our clients that we did an audit for. And more good, more, we do more than just content optimization in our audits, but all the techniques that we're going to be covering today 
account for maybe 70 to 80 percent of on-page optimization. And this is the result of what you can see when you clean up your website. So top left here, we have um, keywords that were ranking on page one went from a little over 2,000 to a little over 3,000, the jumps in Google positions, and also Google organic traffic. So big increases just from cleaning up the website, nothing else. So this stuff really works. All right, jumping right off the bat. Topical focus, that is the first thing that you should be focusing on before you focus on any other optimization techniques because it is going to drive your strategy for everything else on your website. Each page should be focused around one topic that is as specific as possible. Be relevant for one thing. Don't try to be relevant for everything. And also drill it down so that you're covering each thing specifically. One page for everything that is important on your website. Make sure that you have a page for everything that is important on your website. We had a client that it was a bottled water delivery service, and they said that their most profitable service was um, home deliveries. They didn't have a page on their website for home deliveries. How are you going to rank in search engines when you don't talk about home deliveries on your website? Google doesn't understand. So you need to cover every topic that you want to rank for with a page on your website. This is an example from um, another client that we worked with. They do use fitness equipment. And so this is the brand pages that they worked with. And you can see that they have it pretty well segmented out here as far as being specific. They have uh, light fitness cardio, light fi fitness strength equipment. So that's good because you're being really specific as far as cardio equipment or strength equipment. One thing that they're missing here is what if someone searches for used life fitness equipment? There's no page for that. There's a page for life fitness cardio, life fitness strength. There's not a page for life fitness equipment. In this case, you have two pages that are equally as relevant for a very popular search term and then you have competing topical focus. When that happens, Google gets confused. So you want to create a page that is relevant to your one main topic. So then if you have your main topic pages, everything else that is on your site should support those main topic pages. In the example that I just talked about, we, had, we told them to add the um, life fitness equipment page, and then they have the cardio equipment page and the strength equipment pages which support those topics. You'll then want to also build out blog content to further support those topics, showing that you're an expert in this field, that you are an authority in the topic that you're talking about. This is a screenshot from Answer the Public. It's a really great tool if and no one's used it. Um, you can go ahead and put in any term you want in there, and it's going to pull out some queries that pe people often search for. It'll create this little circle like this, which gives you lots of different ideas of different things that you could be writing about in terms of blogs in order to further establish yourself as an authority around the topic that you're writing about. And so when you're putting together all of this content and you're structuring out the different pages, focusing around each topic. You want to make sure that you remember Google's perspective, which is that it wants to provide the most relevant page to the query that the user is looking for. Don't try to be relevant for everything, because you'll end up being relevant for nothing. So now that you know what topical focus is, how do you identify if you have problems with competing topical focus? There's a couple different ways to do this. We like to use Screaming Frog, which is a search spider. And there's a link to it up there. It's free for the first 500 URLs. And so when we are looking for topical focus competition, we usually just go in and source this by page title. So you can see this is an example from another client that we worked with. They wanted to rank for accept credit card payments. Accept credit card payments, the blog post is probably not the best page to rank for that keyword. It's not going to convert. It's not what customers are looking for when they're searching for accept credit card payments. They want the home page to rank for that. However, they had all of these blog posts that start with accept credit card payments. You're confusing Google by doing this. You're competing with your home page. And if you're already competing with all the other search, all the other sites out there, you don't want to compete with yourself. So this would be an example of competing topical focus that you would want to then address for later on. If you don't want to use Screaming Frog, another quick way to do it is to do a site search in, in Google Chrome, site colon, 
then the domain name and the keyword that you're looking for. There's an example of that over on the right. And you can see in this example that there's no competing topical focus for dragon myths. There's only one page that's coming up as dragon myths and everything below that is about other stuff. So this is a good example with no competing topical focus. So competing topical focus, it's a problem. It confuses Google. You want to be very, very specific in the one page that is the most relevant for the query that the user is looking for. In this case, we wanted our client to rank for the ones that are the page, the URL that's in the box at the bottom. However, there are other URLs on the page that Google consider to be equally as relevant for these keywords. And you can see every time the URL changes, the position in Google changes too. And this is because the there. These pages were not optimized as well. However, they're overlapping as far as the focus of the page. And so Google's not sure which URL to rank. So it keeps testing it. It keeps picking different URLs. And as that happens, rankings are jumping up and down. And ultimately, you want to fix this in order to have your one main optimized page rank in search engines. So how do you fix this? There's a couple different things you can do. You either refocus the pages to be more specific and more separate. So if they're talking about different things, but there's a little bit of overlap, maybe you remove that overlap, you force one more in one direction, force another one more in the other direction so that they're no longer overlapping as far as the, the topical focus. Or you can combine the pages and then 301 redirect the URL from the page that you're removing to the page that you're keeping. This is generally a really good way to do it because if you have something that is competing that much, then combining them, you're now creating one really great, relevant, highly authoritative page that has a lot of content. And that page is gonna be very appealing to search engines for ranking. When if you want to go decide which page you wanna remove and which one you wanna keep, the best way to do this is to go into your analytics account, put the URLs in, of the two pages that are competing, and then see which one is getting more traffic. Remove the one that's not getting as much traffic and that's the one you wanna redirect. Or if they're getting a similar amount of traffic, go into your Google search console, look at how many impressions each page is getting and remove the one that's not getting as much impressions. So the other option is to de-optimize the less important page. So the example that I showed earlier with the blog posts that have accept credit card processing at the beginning of the page title in the blog posts, in this case, the blog posts, we weren't gonna combine those with the homepage because the blog posts still offer additional value to the website. They're ranking for other long tail keywords, so we don't wanna get rid of them, but we can de-optimize them at least for this one specific keyword. Remove it, the keyword from the page title, take it out of some of the H tags, reduce the amount that it's showing in the content, and then within those blog posts, we want to link from it using an anchor text for the keyword and going, put that link going to the homepage. So you're creating a relationship from the blog post to the homepage for the specific topic that you're trying to rank for. All right, so topical focus done. Next, URL structuring and siloing. So once you've decided on your topical focus and you figured out what everything is going to cover, you then want to build out your URL structure. Or if you already have a website that's out there, you might want to revamp your current um, structure. So you want to make sure that you're including your main keyword in your URL without being spammy. You don't want it to be like dog sitting and dog park watching and dog services in Los Angeles, Encino, California. Like that gets way too long. You're putting way too much into that one URL. Have the URL be specific, stay on your topic, and only put relevant keywords in that URL. Google or what WordPress does a pretty good job of this because it generates URLs just based on the, the title that you put in already. And so it's going to put something relevant based on the, the title of your page. So it's going to keep it pretty much on topic already for you. But you can still go in there and change your permalink structure if you want to and update it to be something that's more relevant. So URLs should be organized by topics and subtopics such as the picture over to the right. You don't want to have a flat structure where you have your homepage and then every other URL that is just after your homepage. So slash, same thing. This is flat, it's boring, it doesn't help 
you at all as far as, as far as search engines are concerned. It doesn't give you any sort of relationship between your pages. If you have a structure that is like the one on the right, which is the per correct siloing structure, you now have your home page. You now have a category for your products, a category for your services, a category for your blog. And then you have each one of those different types underneath each of those categories. It makes it a lot easier for Google to, to digest. And it understands that each of these pages are related to your main category. So when putting together these categories for your blog or these silos, you want to use, blog is still good to use as a category, as an overarching silo that you put your content into, blog makes sense. However, category does not. So like I said earlier, when we were talking about Yoast settings, make sure you remove the word category from your, your URL as it doesn't help and it doesn't add any more additional information. So here is an example. Um, this is a, another client that we worked with that had a flat URL structure. So everything was .com forward slash product name. In order to make this a correct siloing structure, what we recommended doing was .com forward slash bakeware, since all of these products were bakeware products, then forward slash product name. So now Google understands that all of these products are bakeware products. And not only are you creating this relationship, but by putting all of these different products under your one main category, you're showing Google that you have a lot of different pages about your main category, that you're an authority on that category. So you're not only helping these full longer URLs to rank, you're also now cr uh, creating a situation where you can rank for the category itself. And over here to the right, you can see an example of what would be a good siloing structure where you have your main category of dog services, and then that's broken down into daycare, grooming, boarding. You have another category of dog training, again, broken down into classes, school, boarding school. So this is a really good way to organize your, your, your URLs once you've decided the topical focus of each of those pages. Moving on, next we're going to page titles. So the page title is one of the most important ranking factors on your page. So once you have set up your URL structure, the next thing you really want to focus on is crafting a really, really good page title. The first thing I would recommend you do is just go to Google and search for your main keyword and see what comes up, see what's working, because there's a reason that the pages that are ranking are ranking. So use this as a guide when you're writing your own page title and yet at the same time be different. If you look at the first page of Google, all of the page titles that you're going to see there are different. None of them are the same. So don't copy and paste what's already there. Just kind of use it as like a Mad Libs where you can move things around and change a word here and there. In general, you want to put your most important and competitive keyword first because the beginning of your page title carries more weight than the end of your page title. So don't put your company name at the beginning of your page title. It's not helpful to you. Put an important, difficult to rank for keyword. It will add more value to the page. You then want to incorporate other keyword variations into the page title in a logical way. Don't just stuff keywords in here. Again, this needs to be useful to human viewers, not for search engines. So make sure that you have all of your keywords and your variations, but it makes sense when you read it. You don't want to over-optimize. Again, no stuffing. There are um, some exceptions to this, which I will go over in a second. And in general, most things that you read will say that you want to stick to either 65 or 70 characters. It varies because Google changes how many characters it shows. Um, this is not entirely true. There's a little bit of wiggle room here. You not, you're not going to get dinged if your page title is 75, 80 characters long. If you're if you are putting together a really well-crafted page title that has good keywords, good keyword variations, and you're going a little bit over this, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, don't put something in there that's like 150 characters long, because then that's a little too much. But if you're going to go a little bit over, it's really not a big deal. And also, if you've noticed, a lot of the time Google is going to rewrite your page titles anyway based on the query of the user. So if you're putting important stuff in your key, in your page title, Google will rearrange it based on what the, the user is searching for. So the more important information you can put in there, the better. And on your inner pages, you want to avoid putting the company name in the page titles. 
It just doesn't add any value. Google knows that this page is relevant to this company. It understands that already. You don't need to use up your character space by putting a company name in your page title. Here's some examples. So on the left, we have a search for e-commerce platforms. You can very quickly see that there's some common things coming up in these page titles. Top e-commerce platforms, top seven e-commerce pl platforms, best e-commerce platforms, five best, and a bunch of them have a year in there too. So if you want to rank for e-commerce platforms, this is what's working. So I would highly recommend that you use some variation of top or best with a number in there, plus e-commerce platforms, plus a year, because clearly this is what Google likes. So don't try to reinvent the wheel, just go ahead and use what's there and modify it to fit your site. Over here on the right, we have um, a search for bow ties. Very different type, different type of result as far as page titles are concerned. Bow ties, formal men's bow ties, bow ties with no space, bow tie experts, bow ties, men's bow ties, shop bow ties, space, no space, S, no S. This is an example of over-optimizing, but this is what's working for this search term. This is what Google is responding to. So if you want to rank for this keyword, even though it's technically against like best practices, because it is a little over-optimized, this is what's happening. This is it. So I would include bow ties, space, no space, S, no S, and some sort of variation in your page title, maybe two, maybe three times, because there's people that are doing it that are ranking. And if they're ranking, that means you should do it too. All right, up next, it's not in the royal court because it's meta descriptions. Meta descriptions are no, the content in meta descriptions are no longer a ranking factor. They have been cooked, kicked out, they have been exiled, they have gone the way of the meta keywords, which also is no longer a ranking factor from many, many years ago. So you still need to have a meta description on your page and it still needs to be unique. So this is a quality signal. This is not a ranking signal, it is a quality signal. So that's why earlier on when we were talking about Yoast and using um, excerpts to generate a meta description, that's the easiest way to do it. And so you will have a meta description that's on your page, which fulfills the quality signal. However, for your home page, for some of your inner pages, if there's something that's a little more specific where you do want to write your own meta description, since the content in there doesn't really matter as far as ranking, as far as keywords, you might as well just put some marketing copy in there. So if you're ranking number three or number four above someone that's number one and below someone that's number one and two, and the meta description for the people that are number one and two are things like filter by price or available in different types of colors. That's not really a good incentive to click into those pages. However, if your meta description says free shipping, money back guarantee, what's what are people gonna click on? If you're just right there and you're right next to the top guys, you can steal some of those clicks by having a good meta description. Or if you're a local business, say that you're a plumber. If my bathroom is flooding, I am not gonna take the time to click into the top three results to search through those websites to find a phone number to call. If the phone number is right there in the meta description, I'm just gonna call the phone number because my toilet's overflowing and that's a problem that I need to deal with right away. So you might as well put something in your meta description that adds value and incentivizes people to click on your links. And even after all of that, Google is gonna rewrite your meta descriptions anyway, <laughs> vast majority of the time. So there are some instances where the meta description that you carefully and painstakingly craft will show up, but majority of the time, Google is just gonna rewrite it anyway, which again is why I suggest using the excerpts feature in Yoast. Um, and if you don't believe me, here's an example. Position one and two for Android versus iPhone pay. The meta description on the page does not at all match the meta description that is showing research in search results. And this is again because Google is trying to give the best result for the query. It's focused on the user. It's not focused on what you want to tell the user. And so it's taking the content that is on the page of the website that most matches the query and that's what it's serving up in the meta description. All right, so now we're moving on to H tags. 
So in general, there's a in general, you want to have only one H1 tag on your page. The vast majority of WordPress themes will do this automatically. It's the, the title that you put in at the top. Um, where you tend to get into trouble here is that sometimes people will, in the content box, put one of their headers as an H1 header. Or if you have a slider on the website, the, if the text in the slider is an H1, then and you have four sliders, each one of those text on the slider is going to become an h1 text. So you'll end up with four h1 tags on your page. So in general, you want to avoid putting um, h tags in sliders. And you want to have a primary, your primary keyword, again, going back to the topical focus that we started with for the page in your h1 tag. It is next to your page title, the h1 tag is then one of the next most important ranking factors. So you want to make sure that it's focused around the keyword that you want the page to rank for. It's also a good practice to vary this H1 tag from your page title a little bit. Make it something, if you if it's a phrase that you're trying to rank for, um, you can do the same thing. What, what's in your page title, you can just reverse it and say it backwards. So instead of saying dog services in Los Angeles, you can say Los Angeles dog services. Same thing, still getting the keyword in there, but it's a little bit of a variation. You also want to pay attention to H tag hierarchy. So on your page, the H tag, the H1 tag should be the first H tag on the page. You don't want to have an H2 tag above an H1 tag or an H3 tag above an H1 tag. So here's a good example of H tag hierarchy. And it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty intuitive. Um, so when you have your H1 tag, then your next subtopic is going to be an H2 tag. Below that, you might have another subtopic, it becomes an H3, H4, H5, et cetera. You will rarely get down to an H5 or an H6, but in general, keep in mind that you, within each topic, within each heading, you want to follow in the proper hierarchy. You also don't want to put H tags in your footer. This is something that comes, that we want run across a lot um, just in themes natively that when developers have put together themes, they are using the, the headers in the footer, such as about or contact or whatever is down there. They're putting um, H tags in there just for styling purposes. So it, that's not really helping as far as the topical focus of your page. So having things like about or contact in an H tag is not in line with whatever you are trying to rank that page for. So take the H tags off of that content. You can still use CSS styling to make it look the same, but you don't want, actually want to have it in H tag. And that, yeah, don't put random off topic text in H tag. Keep it focused around what you're trying to rank your page for. All right, so now let's jump into the content of the page. Um, if you were here for Arson's talk earlier, he talked a lot about quality. Quality is extremely important. It's one of the, the biggest things that you should be focusing on as far as the content on your page. Your content should be unique and it should be valuable. Now there is a little bit of leniency here for e-commerce since there's only so many different ways that you can write about socks <laughs> in your product description. Um, so in general, still try to make your product descriptions as unique as possible. Um, if you have, uh, if you're selling like t-shirts and you have different products, one product is a small, another is a medium, another is a large, combine those products into one URL and just have a variation option on the page rather than having different pages for each of the sizes because the description is going to be the same. And as far as search engines and users are concerned, it's the same thing, it's just a different option when they're at the, the purchase point. So you want to write your content for humans. Don't worry about writing for search engines. If you are writing authoritatively about a topic that you are well versed in, you are naturally going to include keywords in there already. Don't worry about trying to stuff things in there or hit a certain type of keyword saturation. Those days are, are gone. So make sure that you're being as relevant as possible to your readers. Make it interesting. Make it good for your readers. Longer is better as long as it's quality. Again, quality is the big word here. You want to stay on topic, but you want to be as informative about that topic as possible. In general, we like to recommend around 500 to 2,000 words. Obviously, if it's a product description, it's hard to write 2,000 words about that specific product. So variations there. 
But if it's a services page and you're talking about a service that you offer, you can probably write 500 words about the service that you offer and give a lot of really good information in there. Blog posts are really more where we come in with the 2,000 word plus, if possible. Again, making sure that it's still all quality and that you're staying on topic. You don't want to add a bunch of fluff in there. But like I said at the beginning, search engines really love content. So feed the search engine, give the search engine content. It will help you rank. And especially in those long form blog posts, you want to make sure that your content's scannable. Put things in there like bulleted lists, put in videos, put in images, have headers and subheaders, call to actions, uh, quotes. You want to cite facts. If, you're, if you are writing about something and there is another external source that is trusted, that is an authority about what you're writing about, include a link to that source. If it's a .edu or a .org, like those are generally really good, they're really trusted. And so if you're, it's almost like if you're doing a research paper, like back when you're in school and you're like, here is where I got this information. That sort of link actually adds value to your content as well. Okay, and then here's an example. So um, I like to do a lot of backpacking and outdoor stuff as well, as my intro suggested. Um, so I have a blog where I just write about some of my adventures. And so this is from my blog. So here I talk about a trip that I did and I'm going over the different sections of things that people might want to write about when they're researching how to do this trip, how to get a permit, how long does it take to do the hike, different types of hikes that you can do in a day, breaking it up with different types of headers with punctuation. The little icons in there are created with Font Awesome. If no one is familiar with Font Awesome, it's a WordPress plugin and allows you to do some really just like fun, visually interesting stuff. Um, having bullet points, bolding stuff, making it easy to digest, especially if it's a really, really long form piece of content. This piece of content is um, around 5,000 5, to 6,000 words. So if someone's reading through all of that, you want to make it interesting. And if something's really that long, put a table of contents at the top. Make it easy for people to jump to the part of the content that they want to read about. That way you're serving your user and you're also serving search engines by having this really, really, really long, informative, authoritative piece of content. Up here we have a link to another blog article that specifically talks about permits. And that's because in this case, there is the search for getting permits for this specific, loca this specific location also had a lot of search volume. And so if I want to be topically relevant to that search, this one long piece of content is not going to be the most relevant result because the, it's diluted by everything else that's included in here. So I wanted to create a separate piece of content that's extremely relevant to that one search topic and then link to it. So my two blog posts are linking back and forth, creating a relationship, and again, showing Google, look at all of this information that I have around this topic. I'm clearly an authority on this topic because I am giving you so much quality content. You should rank me for this. And it does. <laughs> all right, so next we're moving into internal linking. So like I just mentioned, internal linking creates a relationship and a hierarchy between your pages. Um, specifically, if you're writing a really long piece of content, a blog post, you want to link from that blog post to your internal pages. That way you're passing authority from that long piece of content to your money making pages. It's something that users might click on, might move into, maybe not, but it's definitely something that the search spiders will follow. So you want to include a uh, keyword in that anchor text and only link once to each of one of your inner pages. Multiple links to the same page from one piece, from like one blog con content, piece of blog content, if you're linking to the same page multiple times, that's not adding any extra value. That's not helping you. So really only link once from the blog post to your inner, your inner piece of content. All right, I'm gonna speed this up because it's got a 10 minute warning. All right, so images. You wanna have images in your text, horizontal is better, it takes up less space, especially um, when you're looking on mobile. It breaks up the text. It also creates an OG image, which if you're not familiar with that, OG is open graph. It, it's what feeds Facebook and Twitter and like all of that sort of stuff. You can also customize different types of images in Yoast 
through that section. Um, it also creates an image for your featured image snippets, like Arson talked about in the, in the last um, talk. If you don't have an image on your page that's closely related to your snippet, it'll pull an image from a different website. And that other website will steal some of your traffic, even though you're the one that has the featured snippet. So you want to optimize your images as far as your file name. Include a keyword in the file name. If it's a stock photo, you don't want it to be getting images 123.png. Make it something that's relevant. Also have um, a relevant alt text on your image when you're putting it into your page. And you want to pre-size your images so that it, you're not using your server to resize them because that's going to slow down the load speed of your site. All right, so now we're done with the royal court. We're going to move into the royal wizards, which is the fun, magical stuff. So schema markup is awesome. You want to use it as much as possible without being spammy. Um, if you do too much or you mark up things incorrectly, um, that will cause problems from you. You'll probably get a notification in your search console. Google will tell you if you've done something wrong. Um, JSON LD is the preferred method of putting um, schema into your site over HTML implementation. It just makes it easier for Google to digest and it also indexes it more quickly. Um, there's a couple different types of schema optimization. Organization, local business, and person are some of the most common. Here are just some examples so you can see there's a whole bunch of different subcategories to organization and local businesses. Be as specific as possible when doing your schema markup and try to fit into, if there's a category for it that relates to you, use that in your schema markup. So in Yoast, Yoast makes it easy um, to do company or person schema markup. Um, this is in the general settings tab. You can just choose company or person, put in the company name, put in a logo, and then you can fill out all of the social profiles on the side. This is going to put the JSON LD markup for the company or the person, and also the same as identifiers for the social personas into your website automatically without you needing to do anything else. And so you'll see also over here, I put in Wikipedia, even though that's not an option that Yoast puts as far as one of the um, social profiles that you can enter. So when this code is generated, it does not, here, I'll just go to the next page so you can see it. So the code is up here on the left. There's nothing in here. It just says same as, and then it puts all the profiles. It doesn't say this profile is your Facebook profile or this, this profile is your Twitter profile. All of the profiles are lumped in there together. So why not put in the things that are relevant? If you have a Wikipedia profile, put it right in there. Wikipedia is a, is a really authoritative source and you want to make sure that you're tying your website to your Wikipedia profile. And why is this great? Because it all feeds the knowledge graph. So Arsen went into the knowledge graph a lot more deeply in, our, um, in the last talk, but knowledge graph is the little box on the side that comes up here. And so by putting this into your website, you will be feeding this so that when the knowledge graph populates, it'll understand your social profiles, understand the domain for your website. If you have the Wikipedia page, it understands that everything is all related. Makes it easy for Google. So if you have a blog, you want to make sure that you have article markup. A lot of uh, themes are coming with this already naturally. Just make sure that it's in there. Um, if you have an e-commerce site, you want to make sure that you have product and offer markup. So that's an example of what product and offer markup looks like if you're not familiar with it. And what that does is generate these type of search results here where you have um, the number of reviews, the, if it's in stock or not, the price. Again, things that are incentivizing people to click into your website as opposed to clicking to someone else. Because even though Amazon is number one here, I'm gonna click on the one with the stars because that looks better to me if it already has five stars over something that doesn't. 